Hi, my name is Mary Wong, and I'm a um, sorry, I'm a TCM practitioner, traditional Chinese medicine doctor, and um, acupuncturist in the Toronto area. And tonight, I'm really excited to talk to you about epigenetics. And um, as a Chinese medicine practitioner, I love when I discovered epigenetics because Chinese medicine has been around for thousands of years, and the science of epigenetics is very new. And when I discovered epigenetics, I just realized how it's one of the same because Chinese medicine has been talking about how the environment has impacted or does impact our well-being all the way down to our cellular level. So what is epigenetics? Well, by definition, it means it's the genetic changes due to environmental influences. And with that, um, the it can cause the change of the organisms and um, this is caused by modification of gene expression without altering the genetic code meaning genes are either turned on or off depending on its environment and this environment can be both um, external to the body definitely external to the cells and it can also be internal in the body, and that's due to the emotional affect. So in Chinese medicine, we discuss the seven affects of emotions. And it is normal and to be human to experience and express things like uh, joy or sadness and grief and anger, frustration, worry, um, anger, and... The, and um, what it means is we do feel it but it's when we harbor something or when we ex um, hold it on onto a certain kind of emotion for prolonged periods that can have a real negative impact on our bodies. So going back to epigenetics and citing some uh, researcher, his name is Dr. Marcus Emoto. And he, Marcuso Emoto, pardon me, he's from uh, Japan. He did uh, lots of research and his interest was in crystallization of water uh, um, cells. And what he did was he performed experiments looking at even the effect of the words, prayer, music, environment, on the crystalline structure of water and what is very cool is when he hired uh, photographers to then take the pictures of them you'll see that they look 100 percent different they don't look at all alike and the other is he when he put different words out positive and negative you also see how it affects the cells and this is water cells so imagine what it would have an impact in our body and of course our body is about 60 to 70 percent water in of itself so i'm going to see if i can just show you um how this looks like so pardon me for one moment this is a casual interaction not a formal lecture by any means okay so here you have it so this one here, if you cannot read, is definitely negative because it says, you make me sick, I will kill you. That was a message that was written on the sample of water. The next one says Adolf Hitler. The next one here says thank you. And then this last one says love and appreciation. So just labeling the water has changed the way the water um, crystallizes when you freeze it and again so imagine the impact of our cells when we'll be more specific here when we talk about fertility and now I'm going to discuss to you um, about the impact of what a doctor says to you so when we talk about placebo effect we often as, uh, associate it with something positive, right? So there are studies that it will indicate that our positive thoughts and our beliefs can impact the way we can heal. So if your doctor gives you, let's say, these pills for um, migraines and you take it 
and you feel 100% improved, but yet later you find out they're sugar pills. That's called the placebo effect, a positive effect. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you have a nocebo effect, which is a negative impact of what someone tells you or what your own um, thoughts or belief system is. And that is, um, nocebo is a Latin word for I shall harm. And what that means is, um, whatever your thought and belief system is, it's going to have a negative impact on how your body will even behave. So, for example, you go to a fertility doctor, and what do they say? Oftentimes, if you're at all over 35 or if you're near 35, they're going to say, oh gee, your eggs are old. So, you have this um, authoritative figure telling you that you have um, negative, well, that your eggs are old, basically. And when you internalize that, and if you believe that thought, sometimes what can actually happen over prolonged periods is that that kind of belief has your bodies and your cells work and veer towards that belief. And to step back and give you another example, um, I love uh, Dr. Bruce Lipton, he's been around, he talks about the biology of belief and how it can impact your um, trillions of cells in your body. And one of the early experiments that he did was um, having to go through, um, he put in Petri dishes uh, different tissue samples. And what he did was he put bacteria in each of the three samples. So they're all genetically identical. But when he grew them in different Petri dishes, what occurred was over time, those um, bacteria culture, when they grew and divided and populated, they literally became and resembled in one dish uh, muscle tissue cells, in another dish, bone cells and another dish I'm gonna make this one up now because I forget what it was so I'm gonna say tendon cells something like that um, point is is that the cells although the DNA were the same the expression of these cells became very different because of the environment it was in and that's a physical environment and again the emotional environment can impact us and then now looking at that I don't want you to despair and think, oh boy, I have to only think positive thoughts so that I can have a positive effect on my cells and my eggs in terms of fertility. And what I mean by that is, you know, we want to be authentic to our feelings. And when we're authentic to our feelings, then we're able to let go of some of these um, negative impacts that are uh, suppressed feelings may have in our body. So when we identify and when we see and let ourselves feel the fear, the sadness, the grief that goes with fertility issues, then we're being true to ourselves and in a way it allows us to um, let go of some of these emotions um, like much of a, a pressure cooker. So we let some of the steam out. And when you let some of that steam out, the body has a better chance of normalizing and how the cells express properly. And I'm sorry, I'm jumping around again, but I want to add in another um, thought when it talks about uh, physical impact of epigenetics. So um, there's a doctor in Toronto. His name is uh, Dr. Bentoff. And when I uh, interviewed him, he was discussing about metformin. And metformin is a drug that is often used for women with PCOS. And in fact, it's kind of like the first line of defense as soon as you walk into a fertility clinic when they find out you have PCOS or when they diagnose you with PCOS. And um, what they do is they just stick you on it as a protocol. And if you have it or take it for a prolonged period of time, there may be an epigenetic result. So what happens, um, let me find it here for you. It's, I, I documented it in my own personal book that I wrote, and uh, that's going to come out in the middle of September, Pathways to Pregnancy. So what he says here is this, metformin inhibits the ability of the cell to produce energy. 
This is the same action as, but less potent than cyanide, which causes cellular death. These uh, less energy means less energy to produce androgens, which are male hormones, and the cell has to compensate for a lack of ability to produce energy in the same level of of efficiency as before. So for long-term use, there's a compensation mechanism causing long-term effects. So when, let's say, humans are given metformin even throughout pregnancy, then that might have an impact down the road on uh, the developing fetus. And how we equate that is uh, there's research from past where um, in the time of war and uh, where there is famine, starvation, when a woman is pregnant in that famine, what occurs is that the developing fetus will develop mechanisms to be able to thrive in a sugar-deprived environment because there's famine, there's less sugar available, less energy available to them as they develop. So they're thriving in an energy-deficient environment. So with metformin, that's kind of the same thing. They thrive in an um, energy-deficient environment, sugar-deficient environment. Now, you take that baby and you put it back out into the real world where there is a lot of, uh, where there is abundance, abundance of nutrients, abundance of food, and all of a sudden, the be it, oh well, the baby now, or, or the developing child, will have issues because it's like there's an overabundance and it doesn't know how to tackle it. So what occurs is like metabolic syndrome, which amounts to, you know, increase of, High, um, increases chance of high blood pressure, obesity, um, increased body fat tissue around the middle, around the waist. There's uh, abnormal cholesterol and triglyceride levels. And then to put together, it, it actually puts one at risk for diabetes, risk for heart disease, and um, stroke. So again, these are epigenetic factors that can impact down the road. And this may not necessarily even just impact in this uh, lifetime, but it can even impact the next generation. So what occurs in this lifetime can impact the following lifetime to even the grandchild's lifetime. And so when we discuss it back to, um, well, how, how do you deal with that, right? In, in terms of emotions, um, don't, don't despair. Like I, I don't think that one has to be forcing positivity when you're going through emotional strife trying to get pregnant. But there are ways that you can deal with it. And one of the ways um, is you know, acknowledging where you're at and in that moment also remind yourself um, about gratitude. So thinking of, um, you know, um, three things that you're grateful for in that moment. So it's not necessarily about being positive 100% of the time, but even allowing yourself moment by moment uh, times of um, feeling a relief from being negative, right? So, uh, so gratitude, there's even... Um, Sometimes just distraction or doing other things can help. I mean, it may still be festering underneath somewhat, but um, distraction might be a good idea for some. And then connecting with nature, just going for walks, I think that is a really positive environment for one to be around, even when you are negative. And um, there's meditation, there's hypnosis, there's literally uh, things like yoga, and uh, Tai Chi, Qi Gong, all of these that connect with your body versus often going in our heads. And, you know, with any kind of chronic illness, illnesses, as well as um, definitely fertility challenge, there's a tendency to worry and go into our head uh, because there's a lot of fear. And so it's a matter of um, not necessarily pretending that we don't have fear, but um, in that moment, going back to, into our body and recognizing it, where does it hit us in our body, and just being with it. So identifying and being and then letting it go, that I think 
will um, affect positively in your outcome for fertility. So, you know, it's, it's not quite right when people say, oh, gee, you know, like, just be, think positive, be positive, and you'll get pregnant. And um, so it's a matter of being kind to yourself and knowing that what you feel is authentic and then finding ways to deal with that in a nice, lighthearted way. And sometimes it's through community. So knowing that you have, um, you have other people uh, rather than just being insular and uh, removing yourself from society, which increases depression. So it's like, um, and if it's difficult to do that with your family or friends, Sometimes it's better to go for a support group of some type. And um, what I have found, and I think I've said this before, sometimes those chat groups, they, it is actually quite depressing. And, you know, it's like people bickering about their own problems. And it's like, well, maybe we need to go outside of that to find something a bit more positive to hold on to. And, you know, instead of looking at other people's demise and their complaints, why don't we look at positive stories um, where they triumph over their demise, if you will. And so looking for positivity, even when you're not feeling the most positive, rather than forcing positivity upon yourself. Um, I have left it so that people can um, email or, or make a comment so I can answer questions. Um, this was meant to be a very casual um, conversation. So if you want to ask questions right now, please do so. Uh, and I'll give you a minute or so. And uh, if not, then I might just sign off and uh, we'll talk about something else next week. Um, in the meantime, I really want to thank you for being here and I hope that um, we can make a difference for you and just know that whatever you doubt genetically doesn't necessarily have to mean that it's a permanent thing. So back to the eggs, you know, if you're told that your eggs are old, please do not believe that your doctor is 100% correct and these are not God's words. This is not a prison sentence, but life is miraculous and we have the ability to change and because we are dynamic human beings and um, we can change all right so it doesn't look like anybody is um, coming out so to speak and um, I think what we'll do perhaps next time is if you have questions please um, PM me prior and then I can address questions ahead of time I know a lot of people are worried about privacy issues especially when it comes to fertility so um, that might be one way to get around it, okay? So PM me, um, ask questions, and let's cover it in the next week. So tune in next week, next Wednesday, 9.30 p.m., and I think um, it might be timely to do something much more practical, and I'll show you how to do some kidney tapping. All right? Thanks, and have a great night. Bye for now.